Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming love Here I raise my I say a hearty and wonderful good morning to any and all that are out there. God bless you. It is good to have you on board and out here. Uh, may God bless as you sign in and uh, we say hi to each and every one. Lisa, good morning to you. You're the first one to sign in this morning. So uh, uh, all four of you, God bless. Welcome, welcome. It's good to be here. All right, I pray you all had a great day yesterday. It was uh, uh, a busy one in our world, and I'm sure it probably was in each and every one of yours as well. So uh, there's Miss Ruth Ann as well coming on board and saying hi. So we say hi to Miss Ruth as well. Hope you're feeling well today, dear. Uh, really do. All right. Well, uh, as we've moved into Chapter 9 pretty thoroughly, Chapter 9, Solomon seems, at least in this uh, first part, to be encouraging us to live to the fullest while we still have opportunity. As long as it's a day, we won't work because the night's coming when nobody's going to work. Uh, in living life to the fullest and seizing the opportunities that life has to offer us, Solomon gives us three very strong admonitions. The first of which we looked at was understand the sovereignty of God. Understand that your days, your actions, uh, uh, everything is in the hands of God. We may not know what is going to transpire during this day uh, or into the week or, or down through the year. We don't know those things. We don't have that kind of crystal ball that lets us look down into the future and, and say, I don't care what anybody has to say about being able to tell you the future. Uh, nobody knows. And if you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, how can someone else tell you uh, the time that it's going to happen? No. God's sovereign 
Our life is in his hands. And the outcome of every event, good or bad, is in his hands as well. Good morning, my dear. It's good to see you. I love my wife. But, uh, you know, so we just need to capture on to that. And once we do, and I've said this before, and I keep coming back to it, because there's not many, I, I can't turn anywhere in Scripture and not see this prevalent uh, doctrine, the sovereignty of God, the transcendency of God, the absolute otherness of God, uh, the uh, the fact that God is is transcendent yet at the same time very very personal. That uh, He is the God who sits enthroned upon the circle of the earth. He is the one who was, is, and is to come. He is the always continual constant I am, the perfect absolute I. He was in the past, I am in the immediate, and he will still be the great I am through eternity. He is sovereign. And as I use the uh, uh, archway to describe what uh, I believe to be keystone truths, those that stone at the top of the arch, that the more weight and pressure you put upon these truths, the more stability you find in your life, as would be if you put more pressure on the keystone, the arch is stronger. Sovereignty of God is probably one of the most primary keystones in our life. And the more weight that we can put on the sovereignty of God over our life and over the things of this world, the more stable we're going to be, the less transient we're going to be, the less fluid we're going to be, the more solid we're going to be, so that when winds blow, you know, I think one of the interesting things is they say when there's an earthquake, get in a doorway because it's reinforced and, and it, it's strong. That's the arch. Get under the arch. And uh, no matter what storms of life you know, may come your way, that arch will hold you. That arch will be your strong uh, place that protects and guards you. So the sovereignty of God is that keystone. At least I pray that I'm able to make it and keep it the keystone of my life. And I've had a few pops there coming up. There's Miss Sue and Miss Helen and Miss Donna. God bless all of you. It's so good to be with you this morning. Now, the second uh, uh, admonition that Solomon gives us is we were in the middle of that yesterday. We'll wrap it up this morning. Think about your faith, your fate rather, what tomorrow holds. It's the same, he says, for all. There is one faith for the righteous and the wicked, for the good, for the clean, and for the unclean. For the man who offers sacrifice is the one who does not sacrifice. As the good man is, so is the sinner. As the swearer is, so is the one who's afraid to swear. And he says, this is... Get that move forward. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun. There is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. And afterwards, they go to the dead. Remember that Solomon sees death as an evil because it is not God's intended plan for your life or mine or anyone else's, but rather it's the result of man's sin and rebellion. So since death is a result of sin, then that makes it evil at its very core, all right? Also, as Solomon describes man, he calls him full of evil, and insanity is in his heart throughout their lives. Sin is madness. It's rebelling against the only God who loves you and submitting yourself to his eternal judgment because you think in some way that you're better off without him. Well, that's insanity. And we looked at verses 5, 6, and 10, and we were there yesterday as we closed this, uh, this lesson. Sol Solomon gives us the reason why death should be arousing our thinking, should cause us to look seriously at life. For the living know they will die, 
but the dead do not know anything, nor have they any longer a reward, for their memory is forgotten. Indeed, their love, their hate, their zeal have already perished, and they will no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. And then verse 10 says, Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might, for there is no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol, in the grave, you know, in death, where you are going. Basically, not to read more into this than it should be, Solomon wants us to consider that when we die, all of our opportunities and all of our participation in those things that happen under the sun in this world, in this life, cease. So since we only have one life to live, since we only go around once, let's make most of your life while you still have the chance. There's my sweet Laura. God bless you. I love you. And I see two great grandbabies in that picture. That's kind of neat. All right. Since today is the only day that I have, and these moments are the only moments that I've been given, then it's to my advantage and my mental and physical well-being to seize the day, to take advantage of every opportunity that God places before me, to live my life to the fullest for the glory of God. I pray that makes sense. And when we look at life in that fashion, then we look at the day as a day of hope and a day of challenge and a day where, where uh, this, is, this is the moment I've got and I'm not going to waste it. The idea behind it, of course, is, is if I knew I was going to die tomorrow, what would I do? Uh, some people would shrivel up into a ball and they, they'd waste the last moments they have. Others would make it the best day they could have possibly have for their families and others. Others would, would press to do that thing that they love the most to do. If, if, if you love you know, your service to God and you see the eternal value of it, knowing that I had just this limited time, I would put every bit of energy that I had I would pray into accomplishing whatever purposes of God I can accomplish in that day. And we ought to live each day like that, with our eye on eternity, knowing that I have an expiration date, not knowing what it's going to be. I live my life to the fullest, and I seize every opportunity that God gives me. Well, let's go ahead and pray, and we're going to move right, right on in from there. Father, we thank you so much that we can gather together today. Come here. Come to the, as the song said earlier, come to the very fount of every blessing. We come to you as the, as the, the headwaters, Lord, of mercy and of grace, uh, the headwaters of knowledge and understanding. We come because you are the fountainhead from which all life springs. In you is life. Lord, you are the way, the truth, the life. In you, you are the very embodiment of life. You have life within yourself. You are, you, you are, it, 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 I guess, in a, in a word, self-generated. You, you have life in yourself. We do not. It takes something outside ourselves to give us life, but not you, Lord. You have life in yourself. And Jesus, as you said, you had the right to lay your life down and the power to pick it back up again. None of us can. We might be able to lay our life down, but we'd never be able to pick it up. God, you are great, gracious, and wonderful. Clear the cobwebs out of our head. Put the, the affairs of the day aside so that we can see and concentrate on you so that we have direction for the day. Uh, Lord, build each piece like this, one piece upon the other. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, under the authority of the divine Son of God, second person of the, of the Godhead, amen and amen. All right. Now, we have to be careful not to push Solomon's word and what he's saying beyond the point that he's trying to make. Don't let's, no, let's try weave a whole tapestry out of, out of one piece. Let's not miss the point that he's trying to make. 
You can't go back and you can't change the past. What do is done is done. I know we all think if I could just go back and have a do-over. Well, most of us have lived long enough, uh, even to our youngest listeners, that we know that there's not any do-overs. There's no mulligan in, in, in the game of life. There just isn't. Uh, sometimes we can repair the mistake that we made, but we can never change that mistake. We can go back and make amends and, uh, and get forgiveness from people and restore relationships, but we can never undo what broke that relationship in the first place. We can't go back. And, and we really need to understand that. That really needs to be a, uh, uh, a strong point with a, in our life, an understanding that we can repair, but we can't erase. All right? The nice thing is God is the on. He can not only rebuild and repair our lives, but he can erase our mistakes you know, from that book, our sins, our errors, so that when we stand before him, we stand clean uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ. What's done is done. We may never have a chance to, to, to go back and, uh, and even make it right. If you're familiar with, with, with golf, uh, you know that term, take a mulligan. Uh, it's just another way to say there's no do-overs. Uh, you can't take an extra swing because you missed that one. Well, Solomon's saying there ain't no do-overs in life. So don't miss that because soon your opportunities will be over. Uh, before moving on, I ought to point out that one of the opportunities that we have in this life is to repent and believe the gospel. For those of you that are out there, that are sitting on that, that, that edge, you're, you're just still struggling with making that decision. Understand uh, that uh, the opportunity to, to receive the forgiveness of your sin, to repent, turn from it and follow Christ, believe the gospel, that opportunity will run out. And certainly on, on our, our, the day we die, that opportunity is, is wrung out. That, that's all there is. There's not going to be a second chance in some other place. There's not going to be a, a, a purgatory that you can get prayed out of. There's not going to be that, that holding place where somebody's going to come and preach some gospel to you and immediately you're, you know, you'll receive that and spring out. No, it, it, it's not like that. There is no do-over. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, you all ought to be familiar with this. It is appointed for man to die once, but after this is judgment. What comes next after, after I, I die? You know, what, what's the, the next big event that's going to show up? Well, I'm going to be present with God. I understand that. But if you don't know Jesus, you'll, you'll die and you'll remain separated from God and all that is left for you in the future besides, besides eternal you know, punishment is the judgment that is going to set that in place. So please don't miss that. And believer, understand this. You and I don't miss judgment either. Oh, not for our sins. That's the great white throne judgment. We know that. Our sins have already been judged on the cross in Christ Jesus, certainly. But Paul speaks greatly, as does Peter you know, and, and others in the New Testament, of the, of, of, of the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, which every believer, every child of God will face. And it is there that the work of our life is going to put, be put through the fire, like on a conveyor belt, and it's going to go in. All of it will be heaped up, and uh, it'll be a mixture of stuff, uh, Precious stones and gold and silver type things and hay wood and stubble type things. These are all building blocks and they're all good building blocks in their place, but not all those building blocks are eternal. It'll go through the fire of God's judgment and what comes out on the other side will be purified in every way. What is burned up will be hay, wood, and stubble. Those things that are not eternal. And uh, uh, they'll be, you know, burnt up like ash. And all we'll have left at the end of it is whatever was eternal, whatever whatever was considered by God, that stuff that he does in our life and through us, our ability to, to serve him and be faithful to him, all of these things 
will be like precious gold and silver and precious stones, of which at the end we lay down at the feet of Christ because he's worthy. Because anything good in us comes from him. Anything good that we do is him doing through us. Oh, that's beautiful. But then we get the reward of the crown, the crown of righteousness. All right? So uh, uh, if you're not sure whether you're saved or not, you have today, you have this time that you know that you have. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, it says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This is your opportunity. You don't know whether you'll get another opportunity. You don't know what holds the afternoon or the morrow. The God who loves you is reaching out to you now. This is your opportunity. Put your hands up to him and surrender. Give it to him. Seek his forgiveness. Turn from your sin to follow him. Uh, forsaking all, that acrostic for faith, forsaking all, I trust him. Come to that point, because you don't, you're don't you not assured you'll have that opportunity again. So if you're unsure whether or not you're saved, that must be your first priority while you still have time. Point number one, understanding God's sovereignty. And point number two, think, uh, think serious about your faith. And then we come to point number three, which is make the most of your time. Oh, that's... That's so simple that, it, that, that we can miss it all too often. It's so logical, I don't know how we keep stumbling over it. But look at verses 7 through 10. Go then, eat your bread in happiness. Drink your wine with a cheerful heart. For God has already approved your works. Let your clothes be white all the time and let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with a woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, with the husband that you love, the man that you love, with all the fleeting days of your life. You see, it's, it's, yeah, it really is, you know, fits both of us. Which he has given you under the sun, for this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might, for there is no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Shoal where you are going. Those things aren't necessary. So the instructions in verse 7 sound really familiar to us, doesn't they? Go then, eat your bread in happiness, drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. If I've counted right, this is about the sixth carpe diem, or seize the day passages, in the book of Ecclesiastes. Yet this passage stands out from all the others. And what makes it the pinnacle passage on, on, the enjoy, on enjoyment in this book? Well, first of all, there are imperatives. Uh, in, in other verses about enjoying life, they start out something like this. There's there's nothing better than to eat, drink, you know, etc. But in verse 7, it says, go. He's not saying there's nothing better. Now he's saying go. Go and, and, and eat your bread and go and drink your wine, you know, in, in, in cheerfulness and happiness with a cheerful heart. There's an urgency to these instructions that flows out of what Solomon has just said about the brevity of life. Second, this passage stands out because it discusses a couple of topics not found anywhere else in the book. For instance, there's a reference here to anointing your head and wearing a white garment. So let's just talk about that for a moment. How have you ever, you know, you know we don't think about wearing white to a funeral, do we? You know, uh, no, sometimes a guy might wear a white shirt, certainly. But the point is that this is the opposite of sackcloth and ashes. All right. Now, we've already talked about the funeral, haven't we? Now, some of you may remember all the way back in chapter 7, Solomon says it's, it, it's better to attend a funeral uh, than a party. You know, 
don't waste your life out there because, you know, we know that when you get the answer of all things at this end. But these two instructions are not mutually exclusive. They don't press the always in verse 8. And, and, and we shouldn't not press it too far as if it's never appropriate to mourn. No. Remember, he also says there's a time to, to, to laugh and there's a time to mourn. Rather, we should understand that this is our typical attitude and it should be one of rejoicing. Solomon doesn't seem to think that true joy and mourning are necessarily at odds with each other. You know, when I think of, of Solomon's writings, and it, it looks to be kind of uh, uh, schizophrenic at times, he's saying, you know, that, that, that there's mourning and, and, and we need to mourn this way, we do, and mourning and, and, and in the midst of it, joy and all of this, it all kinds of gets mixed up. As I thought about it, though, I thought about a, a particular scene, if you've ever seen it, if you've ever seen uh, you know, on a movie or, or live in New Orleans, a traditional funeral procession in New Orleans. As the body is carried to the cemetery, they walk to the cemetery under the sound of, of, of a death dirge, really slow walking, mournful music, as if the weight of the world has been laid on their shoulders. It's simply a physical, a, a visual picture of sorrow and, and, and mourning. But once that graveside work is done and the body is lowered, as they leave the grave, the music turns to a joyous celebration. And the attendees leave the cemetery dancing and singing and celebrating. Maybe when you look at that, they've, pretty much captured the essence of what Solomon is saying here. Now, another topic found only here in Ecclesiastes is the topic uh, uh, of, of marriage. Solomon says, enjoy life, as, as it relates to what we're talking about. It says, enjoy life with the woman, or the husband, whom you love all the days of your feeding life, which he has given you under the sun. Get married and enjoy life. But one final thing that makes this passage stand out is the emphasis that there is on work. But let me go back to that last one just a moment. You know, God has given us marriage, given us our, our, our husbands or our wives as a precious gift to be thoroughly enjoyed. I, Sherry and I have been blessed over the years to be around so many couples who have been married for, for long, long periods of time, 50, 60, 40, you know. But they got married, and all of them got married. And they stuck it through the hard times and the, the good times, the laughter and the sorrow, the pain and the hurt and the, and, and the joy that, that, that life is made up of. And they've hung in there together, and they've grown stronger and closer and, you know, more precious. And, and they go on 60, 75 years. I saw a couple married one time nearly 80 years. I was called to the house. There had been a death scene. The wife had, had, had gone home to the Lord, and they were both approaching 90 years old. And uh, they had been married almost almost if they'd made it another week they'd have been married a full 80 years that's phenomenal to me and i if if the lord tarry and we're still around i want to see that day i want that celebration we passed our 50th and it's it's still a joyous honeymoon we're like anybody else. We go through all the same kind of problems and ups and downs. But I know what it means when God says, enjoy the woman who you love. Or the woman, enjoy the man who you love. All the days of your fleeting life, which God has given us under the sun. So get married. And enjoy the pleasure that is found in your spouse. Well, let's go back now. To the emphasis that he makes on work. In verse 10, uh, it says, whatever your hands find to do, 
Do it with all your might, for there is no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Shoal where you are going. In our culture, we tend to view work as nothing more than a four-letter word. It's a necessary evil. We complain about it. We try to do as little as possible with it. But the Bible is clear that work also, like the, the man or the woman that God has given you, uh, you know, is a gift from God. It just is. It, is. it is the blessing that God has given us. And that is a blessing to work. When did God put Adam in the garden to dress and to keep it? Was it before the fall, before evil, or, or after? Well, we know the answer to that. It was before. When did God tell him to name the animals, before or after the fall? No, it was before. Therefore, the work that we're given done under the sun uh, in this life, our work is a blessing and should be a joy. You say, oh, I don't like my job. My husband doesn't like his job. Well, understand that. But, you know, we can make some choices in our life when we begin to see that job that we may not like is a gift from God to work out his purposes in our life. Sometimes when we start enjoying what God has given us to do, he may move us on to those greater pastures, to that job that we would really love to do. There's a lot of jobs I've done in my life that uh, I wasn't pleased to do. I didn't like digging ditches and laying sewer pipe. That wasn't the heyday of my life. I didn't like climbing up on 18, 20-foot A-frame ladders and hiding and hanging sprinkler pipe for fire protection system. Wasn't too crazy about that, not at all. I did enjoy working on ranches and, and working with stock and, and stuff like that, but it had its limits as well. It got pretty cold out there sometimes in Gunnison country. I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm... There's a lot of jobs I did. I didn't like a pump gas. I've, well, I've done a lot. Enjoyed cutting meat. Really, really enjoyed it. And still like getting a knife in my hands and doing some of that sometimes, certainly. But I found my dream job, if you will, my calling. And it's the, the, the greatest happiness and joy of my work experience. Imagine a life without any work at all. I'm not just talking about being retired. I, I know a lot of retired people that still work a lot. Come down to the church and you'll see a whole bunch of them. All right. I'm not talking about no work, period. Wouldn't that be? Yeah, I, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, absolutely nothing. I would find that quite boring. Well, it would be. Because we were created to work. And even if somebody is retired, doesn't mean they stop working. Or they shouldn't. Because if all you do is sit, you'll, you'll begin to rust. And that's no way to live your life. Now please, don't get me wrong. Just like other good gifts, work can be taken to an unbalanced and unhealthy extreme. That's my tendency in life, and I know that. They, they call people like that workaholics. It's an addiction to them, if you will. And it can be unhealthy. We can work for wrong reasons or work to the exclusion of other important things. We can also work at the wrong thing. As believers, Paul, though, gives us wise counsel when he says, among other things, whatever you do, no matter what it is, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the, of the Lord Jesus and in dependence upon him, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul also calls us to be cautious in how we go about our work, in fact, in how we conduct the affairs of our life. In Ephesians 5, this is the Amplified again, verses 15 and 18, uh, through 18, says, Therefore, see that you walk carefully, living 
with honor, purpose, and courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil. Do not as unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, and discerning people. Verse 16. Making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence. Doesn't that sound just a little bit like Solomon? Because the days are filled with evil. Therefore, do not be foolish and thoughtless, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that's wickedness, it's corruption, it's stupidity. But be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly guided by Him. That's one of the most beautiful, I think, renderings, expositions on those verses you'll find anywhere. I love the Amplified. Don't preach out of a lot. I'll bring a verse now and then because it gives such incredible clarity to that verse. But it's pretty hard to, to, to preach out of it you know, as your primary text that you, you work from. As Christians, the most important task we could possibly work on is the task of the Great Commission. But sometimes we lay up treasures on earth instead of in heaven. So uh, there are pitfalls to be avoided. But however you shake it out, work itself is good. One of the cool things I've discovered in uh, that second half of verse 10 is Solomon provides us with somewhat of a commentary on what it means to work with all your might. Solomon says, work with all your might because there's no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. The implication here being that our work right now is to include those things. It's to include... uh, uh, Device and knowledge and wisdom is include all of these things. Makes sense? I think it does. So what do these words mean? Well, there's a lot of crossover, so I don't want to read too much into this. We have a tendency to do that, especially in difficult passages. We're always looking for the deeper meaning when sometimes what you see is what you ought to read. Uh, but there is some distinction. The word work has to do with industry or enterprise. Our work is to involve initiative and creativity. We shouldn't have to be told what to do every time. You know, uh, I think that's one of the things that drives employers or a supervisor crazy. They'll tell somebody, you know, a job to do. They'll show them how to do that. They'll get them to do it. The person does it. And then the next time it needs to be done, they go back and say, hey, you know, I'd say, well, I don't know what to do. You know, and they're constantly teaching this person over and over because they take no initiative in their own life. Well, I did that job. I was in a place one time and I was watching the, uh, uh, the boss, if you will, uh, talking to uh, a worker. And apparently the worker had uh, uh, finished the, a task that was given him. And he was just standing there reading you know, a magazine, leaning against the wall. And the boss came by and caught He said, what are you doing? He said, well, I, I finished the job you gave me to do. And he just looked at him and said, we're not paying you to read a magazine. Grab a broom and sweep the floor if you can't find anything else to do, or you you go home. We don't need you. And and I think that's what we're you know part of what we're talking about. It it, it it's industry. It's it's taking an initiative. An excellent worker will actually will create work for himself. If he's if he doesn't have the job to do, he's going to find something else to do. He's going to be productive. He's going to make himself valuable to his employer. The word activity could be translated reasoning. Our work is to include strategic planning uh, as we seek to solve problems. It includes knowledge, which can uh, refer to perception and discernment. In order to excel at his or her job, a man or a woman must possess certain levels of technical knowledge 
as it relates to his or her profession. And the more knowledge we obtain, the better we'll be at our jobs and the more valuable we'll be in that marketplace. Finally, the word wisdom carries that basic meaning of skill. It takes practice to get good at something. I was a pretty good meat cutter, but not the first time I picked up a knife, and not the first time, you know, and, and I'm a pretty good saw man, but not the first time I ran something through the saw. It took practice to be able to be good at what it is that you do. It's the same, it's same now with preaching or teaching. It takes practice. It takes education. It takes learning. It takes gathering every opportunity you have to learn something new, to get in and study and be prepared to accurately handle the word of truth. It is the same in any occupation or any job. So to work hard means to take the initiative and to think strategically uh, to, to gain and employ the necessary knowledge and discernment it takes for the job and develop the skills necessary. When you work like that, you bring glory to God. I hope you see, based on this passage, that God wants only the best for you. In, in Psalms 84, verse 11, it says, No good thing will, will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Now, he's not trying to make you miserable. He wants to bless you. Not to say that there won't be suffering. Anyone who spent time in Ecclesiastes or in this life knows there's going to be. But the pattern that he set for us is truly enjoyable. I think it's one of the reasons I love the book of Ecclesiastes. And one of the things that intrigues me about the book is the way Solomon talks about making your life count and things that you can do that put that at the forefront of your understanding. My desire is to live to the fullest, to, to be satisfied in God, to joy his blessings, love his people, to work my tail off for him. I fail at it all the time, but that's my desire. Now, if you're one of the Many young adults or young persons who are part of this study, I pray that this passage is an enabling one for you, that it frees you to go out and enjoy life and serve God within the boundaries that he has set and with him at the very center of that. And if you're an older person, I pray that it's a reminder to make the most of the opportunities that you still have. Enjoy your life. Enjoy work. Enjoy doing for the Lord everything for his glory. Live life to the fullest. The only way to do that is live with Christ at the very core and center, the very focal point of everything you do. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these moments in time, this little snippet of time in a day that we can come and look deeply into your word and let it profoundly impact us. Now, Father, I pray that, uh, that there is on the pages of those who are listening and part of this study a lot of aha moments in this study for them, things that turned on the light and made it understandable. Let them ponder those, meditate on those, Find ways to incorporate those things in their life, to make it a part of them, and to practice it and practice it and practice it until the skill is developed, Lord, to be classified as one who walks in wisdom. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you take us out from this study today and use us mightily in the work that you have given us to do. To you be glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a lot of nuggets of truth and, uh, and, and nuggets for living in, in this passage that we have just read. And I pray you might go over it, look at your notes, read it again, solidify those things that God has been saying to you, and then simply go out and live Jesus in front of people and enjoy the opportunities that God gives you. God bless. Listen, I'm going to be back here at 6 o'clock tonight uh, as we come back together looking again at Jesus in the Old Testament. Tonight, we're going to look at, the, at, at, at you know, our Passover lamb. We're going to be looking at the Paschal lamb. Uh, oh, I love, I love that section in Exodus, and I pray that you join in on it. And maybe we can together 
come up with that which is refreshing and that which is new. May God bless you. See you tonight and then tomorrow morning at 9. I'll be right back here. God bless.